Fifty Shades of Grey by R. L. Stein. Chapter 2 My heart is pounding. The elevator arrives on the first floor and I scramble out as soon as the doors slide open, stumbling once but unfortunately not sprawling onto the immaculate sandstone floor. I race for the wide glass doors, and suddenly I'm free in the bracing, cleansing, damp air of Seattle. Raising my face, I welcome the cool, refreshing rain. I close my eyes and take a deep, purifying breath, trying to recover what's left of my equilibrium. No man has ever affected me the way Christian Grey has, and I cannot fathom why. Is it his looks? His civility? Wealth? Power? I don't understand my irrational reaction. I breathe an enormous sigh of relief. What's in heaven's name was that all about? Leaning against one of the steel pillars of the building, I valiantly attempt to calm down and gather my thoughts. I shake my head. What's that? My heart steadies on to its regular rhythm, and when I can breathe normal again, I head for the car. As I leave the city limbs behind, I begin to feel foolish and embarrassed as I replay the interview in my mind. Surely I'm overreacting to something that's imaginary. Okay, so he's very attractive, confident, commanding, at ease with himself. But on the flip side, he's arrogant. For all his impeccable manners, he's autocratic. Autocratic, is that a word? Okay, fine. And cold. Well, on the surface, an involuntary shiver runs down my spine. He may be arrogant, but then he has a right to be. He's accomplished so much at such a young age. He doesn't suffer fool, fools gladly. But why should he? Again, I'm irritated that Kate did give me a brief biography. While cruising towards Interstate 5, my mind continues to wander. I'm truly perplexed as to what makes someone so driven to succeed. Some of his answers were so cryptic, as if he had a hidden agenda. And Kate's questions... Ugh. The adoption and asking him if he was gay... I shudder, I can't believe I said that. Ground, swallow me up now. Every time I think of that question in the future, I will cringe with embarrassment. Damn, Catherine Cavagan. I check the speedometer. I'm driving more cautiously than I would on any other occasion. And I know it's the memory of those penetrating grey eyes gazing at me, and the stern voice telling me to drive carefully. Shaking my head, I realize that Grey is more like a man twice his age. Forget it, Anna. I scold myself. I decide that, all in all, it's been a very interesting experience. I shouldn't dwell on it. Put it behind you. I never have to see him again. I'm, Im I'm immediately cheered by that thought. I switch on the stereo and turn the volume up loud. Sit back and listen to thumping indie rock music as I press down on the accelerator. As I hit Interstate 5, I realize I can drive as fast as I want. We live in a small community of duplex apartments, close to the Vancouver campus of WSU. I'm lucky. Kate's parents bought the place for her and I pay peanuts for rents. It's been home for four years now. As I pull up outside, I know Kate is going to want to blow by blow account, and she's tenacious. Well, at least she has the digital recorder. I hope I won't have to elaborate much beyond what I thought during the interview. Anna, you're back! Kate sits on the living area, surrounded by books. She's clearly been studying for finals. She's still in her pink flannel pajamas decorated with cute little rabbits. The ones she reserved for the aftermath of breaking up with her boyfriend, for assorted illnesses, and for general moody depressions. She bounces up to me and hugs me hard. I was beginning to worry. I expected you back sooner. Uh, I thought I thought I made good time considering the injury ran over. I waved the digital recorder at her. I'm gonna thank you so much for what you do for doing this. I owe you. I know, how was it? What was he like? Oh no. Here we go, the Catherine Kagan Inquisition. I struggle to answer her questions. What can I say? I'm glad it's over and I don't have to see him again. He was rather intimidating, you know. I shrug. He's very focused, intense even, and young. Really young. Keith gazes instantly at me. I frowned. Don't you look so innocent? Why didn't you give me a biography? He made me feel like such an idiot for skimping on basic research. Kate claps her hand around her mouth. Jeez, Anna. I'm sorry I didn't think. I huff. 
Mostly he was cautious, formal, slightly stuffy, like he's old before his time. He doesn't talk like a man of 20 something. How old is he anyways? 27 days and I'm sorry. I should have briefed you, but I was in such a panic. Let me have the recorder and I'll start transcribing the interview. You look better. Did you eat your soup? I ask, keen on the changing the subject. Yes, and it was delicious as usual. I'm feeling much better. He smiles at me in gratitude. I check my watch. I had to run. I could still make my shift at Clayton's. Anna, you'll be exhausted. I'll be fine. I'll see you later. I've worked at Clayton's since I started at WSU, the largest independent hardware store in the Portland area. And over the four years I worked here, I've come to know a little bit about most everything we sell. Although ironically, I'm crap at any DIY. I leave it all to my dad. I'm glad I can make my shift, as it gives me something to focus on that isn't Christian Grey. We're busy. It's the start of the summer season and folks are redecorating their homes. Miss Clayton looks relieved to see me. Oh no, I thought you weren't going to make it today. My appointment didn't take as long as I thought I can do a couple of hours. I'm real pleased to see you. He sends me to the storeroom to start restocking shelves, and I'm soon absorbed in the task. When I arrive home later, Catherine is wearing headphones and working on a laptop. Her nose is still pink, but she has her teeth into a story, so she's concentrating and typing furiously. I'm thoroughly drained, exhausted by the long drive, by the grueling interview and by being swamped at Clayton's. I slump onto the couch, I think about the essay I have to finish and all the studying I haven't done today because I was holed up with him. You got some good stuff around now, well done, I can't believe you didn't take him up on the offer to show you around, he obviously wanted to spend more time with you. She gives me a fleeting quizzical look. I flush and my heart rate inexplicably increases. That wasn't the reason, surely. He just wanted to show me around so I could see that he was lord of all he surveyed. I realize I'm biting my lips, and I hope Kate doesn't notice. But she seems absorbed in her transcription. I hear what you mean about formal. Did you take any notes? She asks. Uh, no, I didn't. Mm, that's fine, I could still make a fine article with this. Shame we didn't have some originals still. Good looking son of a bitch, isn't he? I suppose. I try hard to sound disinterested, and I think I succeeded. Oh, come on, Anna. Even you can't be immune to his looks. She arches a perfect eyebrow at me. Crap, I feel my cheek heating, so I distract her with flattery. Always a good ploy. I probably would have got a lot more out of him. I doubt that, Anna. Come on. He's practically offered you a job, given that I foisted this on you at the last minute. You did very well. She glanced up at me speculatively. I'll make a haste retreat into the kitchen. So what did you really think of him? Damn, she's inquisitive. Why can't you just let this go? Think of something quick. He's very driven, controlling, arrogant, scary, but very charismatic. I can understand the fascination. I had truthfully hoping this will shut her up once and for all. You? Fascinated by a man? That's a first. She snorts. I, ga I start gathering the, the makings of a sandwich so she, she can't see my face. Why did you want to know if he was gay? Incidentally, that was the most embarrassing question. I was more fine and I was pissed to be asked too. I scowl at the memory. Whenever he's in the society pages, he never has a date. I was embarrassed. The whole thing was embarrassing. I'm glad I have never had to lie on my own names again. Oh, Anna. I can't have that. Anna can't be have that bad. I think it sounds quite taken with you. Taken with me? Nah, Kate's being ridiculous. Would you like a sandwich? Please! We talk no more of Christian Grey that evening. Much to my relief. Once we've eaten, I'm able to sit at a dining table with Kate and, while she's working on her article, I work on my essay on the test of the Dubervilles. Damn, that woman was in the wrong place at the wrong time of the wrong century. 
By the time I finished, it's midnight and Kate has long since gone to bed. I make my way to my room, exhausted but pleased that I've accomplished so much for a Monday. I curl up in my white iron bed, wrap my mother's quill around me, close my eyes and I'm instantly asleep. That night I dream of dark places, bleak cold white floors and grey eyes. For the rest of the week I throw myself into my studies and my job at Clayton's. Kate is busy too, compiling her last edition of the student newspaper before she has to relinquish it to the new editor while also cramming for her finals. By Wednesday she's much better and I no longer have to endure the sight of her pink flannel with too many fucking rabbits PJs. I call my mom and Georgia to check out on her, but also on so she can wish me luck on my final exams. She proceeds to tell me about her latest venture into candle making. My mother is all about the new business ventures. Fundamentally, she's bored. I want to do something to occupy her. To occupy her time. She has her attention span of a goldfish. It'll be something new next week. She worries me. I hope she has mortgages on the house to finance this later scheme. And I hope Bob, her relatively new but, but much older husband, is keeping an eye on her now that I'm no longer there. He doesn't seem a lot more grounded than husband number three. How are things with you, Anna? For a moment I hesitate, and I have mom's full attention. I'm fine. Anna, have you met someone? Wow, how does she do that? The excitement in his voice is palpable. No, mom, it's nothing. You'll be the first to know if I do. Anna, you really need to get out more, honey. You worry me. Mom, I'm fine. How's Bob? As ever, distracting in the best policy. Later that evening, I call Ray, my stepdad, mom's new husband number two, with the man I consider my father and the man whose name I bear. It's a brief conversation, in fact. It's not so much of a conversation as a one-sided series of grunts and responses to my gentle coaxing. Ray is not a talker, but is still alive. He's still watching soccer on TV and going bowling or fly fishing or making furniture when he's not. Ray is a skilled carpenter, and the reason I know the difference between a hawk and a sandsaw all seems well with him. Friday night, Kate and I are debating what to do with our evening. We want some time off from our studies, from our work, and from the student newspaper when a doorbell rings. Standing on our doorstep is our, is our good friend Jose, clutching a bottle of champagne. Jose, great to meet you. Great to see you. I give him a big quick hug. Come in. Jose is the first person I met when I arrived in WSU. Looking at loss, look, looking at lost and lonely as I did, we recognized a kindred spirit in each other that day, and we've been friends, friends ever since. Not only did we share a sense of humor, but we also discovered that Ray and Jose Senior were in the same army unit together. As a result, our fathers have become good friends too. Jose is studying engineering, and is the first in his family to make it to college. Pretty damn bright, but his real passion is f f f photography. Jose has a great eye for a good picture. I have no, sir. He grins, his dark eyes twinkling. Don't tell me you've managed not to get kicked for another week, I tease, and he scowls playfully at me. The Portland Place Gallery is going to exhibit my new photos next week. That's amazing. Congratulations. Delighted for him, I hug him again. Kate B met him too. Way to go, Jose! I should put this in the paper! Nothing like last-minute editorial changes on a Friday evening! She feigns annoyance. Let's celebrate! I want you to come to the opening! Jose looks intently at me and I flush. Both of you, of course, he adds, glancing nervously at Kate. Jose and I are good friends, but I know deep down inside he'd like to be more. He's cute and funny, but it's just not for me. He's more like a brother I never had. Catherine often teases me that I am missing the need a boyfriend gene, but the truth is I just haven't met anyone who, well, whom I'm attracted to. Even though part of me belongs for the fabled trembling knees, heart in my mouth, butterfly in my belly moments. Sometimes I wonder if there's something wrong with me. Perhaps I've spent too much long in the company of my literary romance heroes. And, consequent my, and consequently my ideals and expectation, expe expectation are far too high, but in reality, nobody's ever made me feel like that. Until very recently, the unwelcome, still small voice of my new subconscious whisper 
No. I banished the thought immediately. I am not going there. Not after that painful interview. Are you gay, Mr. Grey? I wince at the memory. I know I've dreamed about this most night since then. But that's just to purge the awful experience from my system, surely. I watch Jose open a bottle of champagne. He's tall, and his jeans and t-shirts, his old shoulders and muscles. Tan skin, dark hair and burning dark eyes. Yes, Jose is pretty hot. But I think he's finally getting the message. We're just friends. The corks makes it loud, and Jose looks up and smiles. Saturday at the store is a nightmare. We are besieged by do-it-yourselfers wanting to spruce up their homes. Mr. and Mrs. Clayton's and John and Patrick, the two other part-timers and I, are besieged by customers. There's a lull around lunchtime, and Mrs. Clayton asks me to check out some orders while I'm sitting behind the counter at the registry, discreetly eating my bagel. I'm engrossed in the task, checking catalog numbers again, the items we need and the items we ordered, eyes flickering from the order book to the computer screen and back as I make sure the entries match. Then, for some reason, I glance up and find myself locked in the bold grey gaze of Christian fucking grey, standing at the counter staring at me. Heart failure. Mr. Steele, what a pleasant surprise! He gazes unwavering and intense. Holy shit, what the hell is he doing here? Looking at all outdoorsy with trousered hair and in his cream chunky white sweater jeans and walking boots. I think my mouth has popped open and I can't locate my brain or my voice. Mr. Gray, I whisper, because that's all I can manage. As the ghost of a smile on his lips and his eyes are all alight with humor, as if he's enjoying some private joke. I was in the area, he said, by the way of explanation. I need to stock up about a few things. It's all pleasure seeing you again, Mr. Steele. Hey, hey, hey. His voice is warm and husky, like dark melted chocolate fudge caramel or something. I shake my head to gain my wits. My heart is pounding at a frantic tempo, and for some reason I'm blushing furiously under his steady scrutiny. I am utterly thrown by the sight of him standing before me. My memories of him did not do him justice. He's not merely good looking, he's the epitome of a male beauty, breathtaking, and he's here. Here in Clayton's hardware store. Go figure. Finally my cognitive functions are restored and reconnections with the rest of my body. Anna, my name's Anna, I mutter. What can I do to help you with, Mr. Gray? He smiles and again it's like he's privy to something big secret. It is so disconcerting, taking a big deep, big deep, deep, deep breath. I put on my professional, I worked in this shop for years facade. I can do this. Here's a few items I need to start with. I like some cable ties, he murmurs. His expression both cool and amused. Cable ties. We stuck various lengths. Shall I show you? I mutter. My voice soft and wavering. Get a grip, Steel. A slight frown mars Grace. Rather lovely brow. Please lead the way, Mrs. Steel, he says. I try for nonchalant as I come out from behind the counter. But really, I'm concentrating hard on not falling over my own feet. My legs are suddenly the consistency of jello. I'm so glad I decided to wear my best jeans this morning. There ain't no electrical guns. I'll eat. My voice is a little too bright. I glance up at him and regret it almost immediately. Damn, he's handsome. After you, he murmurs, gesturing with his long-fingered, beautiful, manicured hand. With my heart almost strangling me because it's in my throat trying to escape from my mouth, I head down one of the aisles to the electrical section. Why is in Portland? Where's well, Ernst Clayton, the Claytons? And from a very tiny, underused part of my brain, probably located at the base of my medulla of and where my subconscious dwells, comes to thought. He's here to see you, no way. I dismiss it immediately. Why would this beautiful, powerful, urbane man want to see me? The idea is pretentious, and I kick it out of my head. Are you important on business? I ask, and my voice is too high. Like I've got my finger trapped in a door or something. Damn! Try to be cool, Anna. I was visiting the WSU farming division. It's based in Vancouver. I'm currently founding some research there with the crop rotation and soil science. He says. 
the matter done factually. See, not here to find it all. My subconsciousness sneers at me, loud, proud, and poity, and po pouty. I flush at my foolish, wayward thoughts. All part of your feed the world plan, I tease. Mm, something like that, he acknowledges, and I, and, and, and his lips quirk up, half in a smile. He gazes at the selection of cable ties we stuck at Clayton's. What on earth is he going to do with those? I cannot picture him as a do-it-yourself at all. His finger trails across the various packages displayed, and for some inexplicable reasons, I have to look away. He bends and selects a packet, pa packet, package, package, packet. These will do, he says, with his oh so secret, secret smile. It's a, it's a crazy one. Is there anything else? I'd like some masking tape. Masking tape. I gotta record the, the directing, redecorating. The words are out before I can stop them. Surely he hires laborers or staff to help him decorate. No, no dick to redecorating, he says quickly and then smirks. And I have the uncanny feeling that he's laughing at me. Am I that funny? Funny looking? That's why, I murmur, embarrassed. Masking tapes is in the decorating aisle. I glance behind me as he follows. Have you worked how long? His voice is low, and he gazing at me. Concentrating hard, I blush brightly. Why the hell does he have this effect on me? I feel like I'm 14 years old. Gosh, it's always out of place. Ice front steel. For four years. I mutter as we reach our goal. To distract myself, I reach down and select the two widths of the masking tape that we stuck. I'll take that one, Gray says softly, pointing to the wider tape which I pass to him. Our fingers brush very briefly, and the current is there again, sapping through me like I've touched an exposed wire. I gasp involuntarily as I feel it all the way down to somewhere dark and unexplored, deep in my belly. Desperately, I scramble around with for my equilibrium. Anything else? My voice is husky and breathy. His eyes widen slightly. Mmm, some rope, I think. His voice mirrors mine. Husky. This way, I duck my head down to hide my recurring, recurring blush and move towards the aisle. What sort way we're after? We have synthetic, a natural filament rope, twine, cable cord. I halt at his expression. His eyes darkened. Holy cow. I'll take five yards of the natural filament rope, please. Quickly, with trembling fingers, I measure up five yards against the fixed ruler, aware that his hot grey gaze is on me. I dare not look at him. Jeez, could I feel any more self-conscious? Taking my stand and knife from the back pocket of my jeans, I cut the coil of it neatly before trying it into slip knots. By some miracle I managed to not remove a finger from my knife. Were you in Girl Scout? He asks, sculptured, sensual lips curling in amusement. Don't look at his mouth. Organized group activities aren't really my thing, Mr. Gray. He arches a bro. What is your thing, Anastasia? He asks, his voice soft, and his secret smile is back. I gaze at him, unable to express myself. I'm on shifting tectonic plates. Try to be cool, Anna. My tortured subconscious beg to bend knee. Box, I whisper, but inside my subconscious is screaming, You! You are my thing! I slap it down instantly, mortified that my psyche is having ideas way out of its league. What kind of books? He cocks his head to one side. Why is he so interested? Oh, you know, the usual classic um, British literature mainly. He rubs his chin with his long index finger and thumb as he contemplates my answer. Or perhaps he's just very bored and trying to hide it. I have to get off this subject. Those fingers on that face are belge, bagolge, bag bagolge. I don't know. What else would you recommend? What would I recommend? I don't even know what you're doing. Frat, do it yourself, eh? He nods, his eyes alive with wicked humor. I flush and my gaze strays up in snug jeans. Come around, I reply, and I know I'm no longer screening what's coming out of my mouth. He raises an eyebrow, amused yet again. Amused, amused yet again. You won't want to ruin your clothing, I gesture. 
vaguely in the direction of his jeans. I could always take them off, he smirks. Um, I feel the color of my cheek rising again. I must be the color of the Communist Manifesto. Stop talking. Stop talking now. I'll I'll take some coveralls. Heaven forbid I should ruin any clothing, he says dryly. I try to dismiss the unwelcome imagine of him in red jeans. You need anything else? I squeak as I hand him blue overalls. He ignores my in inquiry. How's the article coming along? He's finally asked me an easy question, away from all the innuendo and the confusing double talk. A question I can answer. I grasp it tightly with two hands, as if it were a lift raid, and I go for honesty. I'm not writing at Catherine is uh, Miss Cargar, my roommate. She's the writer. She's very happy with it. She's the editor of the newspaper. She was devastated that she couldn't do the interview in person. I feel like I've come up for air. At last, a normal topic of conversation. Her only concern is that she doesn't have any original photographs of you. What sort of photograph does she want? I was going back to Black Preacher again, goddamn. <clears throat> Excuse me, I need to get in with the character. Hey, hey, hey! It's Fred Albert! Yeah, got it, got it. Okay, I'm featuring this response. I shake my head because I just don't know. Well, I'm around! Tomorrow, perhaps! I'd be willing to do a photo shoot. My voice is squeak again. Kate will be in seventh heaven if I can pull this off. And you might see him again tomorrow, that dark place. At the base of my brain whispers seductively at me. I dismiss the thought of all the silly, ridiculous shit. Kate will be delighted if we can find a photographer. I'm so pleased. I smile him broadly, his lips part like he's taking a sharp intake of breath, and he blinks. For a fraction of a second, he looks lost somehow, and the earth shifts slightly on his axis. The tectonic plate slides into a new position. Oh my, Christian Grey's last look. Let me know about tomorrow! Reaching into the back pocket, he pulls out his wallet. My card! It has my cell number on it! Let's call before ten in the morning! Okay, I grin at him. Kate is going to be thrilled. Anna! Paul has materialized at the other end of the aisle. He is Mr. Clayton's younger brother. I'd heard he was from home, home from Princeton, but I wasn't expecting to see him today. Ah, uh, excuse me for a moment, Mr. Gray. Gray frowns as I turn away from him. Paul has always been a buddy, and in the strange moment that I'm having with the rich, powerful, awesomely off the chart attractive control for Gray, it's great to talk to someone who's normal. Paul hugs me hard. Taking me by surprise. Ada, hi! It's so good ah, to see you! He gushes. Hello, Paul. How are you? You home for your brother's birthday? Yep. You're looking well, Anna. Really well. He grinds as he examines me at arm's length. Then he releases me, but keeps a possessive arm draped over my shoulder. I shuffle from foot to foot, embarrassed. It's good to see Paul, but it's always been over-familiar. When I glance up at Christian Grey, he's watching us like a hawk, his eyes hooded and speculative, his mouth a hard, impassive line. He's changed from the weirdly attentive customer to something else, something cold and distant. Paul, I'm with a customer, someone you should meet, I say, trying to defuse the antagonism. I see in Grey's expression I drag Paul over to meet him, and they size, and they, and they size each other's dick up. The atmosphere is suddenly ar 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 arctic. Ar 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 Paul, this is Christian Graham. This is Graham, this is Paul Clayton. His brother owned the place. And for some irrational reason, I feel I have explained a bit more. I've known Paul ever since I worked there, though. We don't see each other that often. He's back from Princeton. We're studying business administration. I'm babbling. Stop now. Mr. Clayton! Hey, hey, hey! Cray holds his hand up out. His look unre unreadable. Mr. Gray. Paul returns his handshake. Wait up, not the Christian Gray of Gray Enterprise Holdings. Paul goes from surely to awestruck in less than a nanosecond. Gray gives him a polite smile that doesn't reach his eyes. Wow, is there anything I can get you? Anastasia has it covered, Mr. Clayton. He's been very attentive. His expression is impassive. But his words is like he's having something else entirely. It's like he's saying something else entirely. It's baffling. Cool! 
poor response. Catch you later, Adam. Sharp sure, ball. I watched him disappear through the stockroom. Anything else, Mr. Gray? Just these items. His tone is clipped and cool. Damn, have I offended him? Taking a deep breath, I turn and head for the register. What is his problem? I ring up the rope, overalls, masking tape, and kettlebell ties. That'll be forty-three dollars, please. I glance up the gray, and I wish I hadn't. He's watching closely. Intently. It's unnerving. Would you like a bag? I ask as I take his credit card. Please, Anastasia! His tongue caresses my name. And my heart, once again, is frantic. I can hardly breathe. Hurriedly, I place his purchase in a plastic bag. You'll call me if you want me to do the photo shoot. He's all business once more. I nod, rendered speechless yet again, and hand back his credit card. Good. Until tomorrow, perhaps. He turns to leave and pauses. Oh, and Anastasia. I'm glad Miss Kanye yeah, couldn't do the interview. He smiles and strides with renewed purpose out of the store, slinging the plastic bag over his shoulders, leading me a query mass of raging female hormones. I spent several minutes staring at the closed door through which he just left before I returned to planet Earth. Okay, I like him. There, I've admitted it to myself. I cannot hide with my feelings anymore. I've never felt like this before. I find him attractive, very attractive, but it's a lost cause, I know. I sigh with bittersweet regret. It was just a coincidence. He's coming here, but still I can admire him from afar, surely. No harm can come of that. And if I find a photographer, I can do some serious admiring tomorrow. I bite my lip in anticipation and find myself grinning like a schoolgirl. I, I need to phone Kate and organize a photo shoot. That was chapter 2. Follow me tomorrow, kids, when I read chapter 3 and I'll teach you how to tie a noose. Bye.